All right, so uh, I want to welcome everybody to Genetic Alliance's first ever research symposium. I'm Sharon Terry, the president and CEO of Genetic Alliance, and I'm really delighted that we're doing this so that we have a forum essentially for probably two purposes at least, and uh, Georgia, who is going to be our host today, will go into this in more detail. But essentially, my passion and drive has been how do we who do so much of the infrastructure for research in the world around the conditions that we're, um, we're, we're working on both get the platforms we need to be able to share that research as well as get the training we need to be able to um, participate in the large international and national conferences on the various diseases. And some of you are very, very um, uh, expert at that and others are new to it. And we really wanted to invite everybody of any kind of um, capacity to this research symposium. Uh, so that you could learn from one another, um, not only the science, but also the various techniques and ways of being together and expl explaining and, and communicating research. Um, I'll also say that um, we have picked a wide variety of presenters in the sense that we have folks from companies as well as folks from common conditions and rare conditions and so on. Uh, so you'll see that in this uh, short time that we'll be together today. Uh, and then lastly, by way of introduction, I want to um, welcome Georgia, uh, who is going to again host today. This was Georgia's idea, and I'm really thrilled by it. It is always fabulous to have uh, staff come up with excellent ideas that, um, that we could benefit from as a community. Uh, Georgia was an intern at Genetic Alliance only last summer and has come aboard uh, and and has really been uh, wonderful uh, to have on staff. And some of you who uh, deal with our IRB, for example, or our registry platform have had uh, experience with Georgia. So without further ado, Georgia, turning it over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Welcome again to our first Genetic Alliance Research Symposium. Um, if you haven't already been in a meeting with me or received an email, invite, etc., uh, my name is Georgia. And like Sharon said, I'm a program manager here at Genetic Alliance. Um, and it's really nice to meet y'all to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So welcome. Um, I wanted to quickly start off by elaborating why we wanted to do this, um, and then I'll go over the schedule really quickly, and then we can get started. Um, so first, to give some context, our symposium is a branch of our Expanding Results Program here at Genetic Alliance. Um, the Expanding Results Program's aim is to aid in pushing research results out into the public space. Um, we really want to get all that great research work that y'all are doing out to, you know, the public, research, pharma, institutions, etc., cetera, um, in order to advance our knowledge and to get outsiders to really pay more attention to all the fabulous work that y'all are doing. Um, and so the purpose of this symposium is to really bring our wonderful communities that we work with together to get that conversation going um, about research itself, you know, the different areas, the difficulties, the successes, um, and the obstacles that groups have when conducting research. Uh, participating disease and advocacy and community groups will be giving 10 minutes um, to present a poster, slides, pitch deck, um, et cetera, or other findings related to their registries, biobanks, studies, um, or other research endeavors. Um, our symposium really gives groups the chance to present in a stress-free and supportive environment. Um, and just looking around and looking at the different organizations that's registered today, um, it looks like we do indeed have that great environment. And then lastly, I hope that participants or spectators um, can learn from their peers and take away something from today's symposium. Um, you may hear about a study that sparks your interest or something that you think would be a good topic to talk about with your own disease community. Um, again, today, if I haven't said it enough, is really about research um, and to really get that conversation going um, and to see what research spaces we're now moving into. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and put the schedule of the speakers into the chat. There we go. And, um, so just to note, we did have one last minute dropout from one of our groups, Lori, um, from AC. Um, 
ACM, CRN. Um, so the groups will just be a little bit shifted, but that'll be totally okay. And now speakers, um, I've said this in the emails, but I ask that you keep your presentations um, just from like seven to eight minutes. So we have time to answer questions and be respectful from each other's time. Um, so this means that those 10 minute slots will include questions from the audience. Um, so be sure to leave some time at the end of your presentation. Um, I also will be sending time reminders into the chat um, while you're presenting so you can stay on track um, and keep, um, keep time. Uh, peers and audience members, if you have any questions during their presentation, which we encourage, um, please send them in the chat or wait until they're done presenting to ask. Um, I also that, ask that you remain muted unless you're asking a question or comment at the end of a presentation. Um, we'll likely have time at the end um, if you don't get your question in that 10 minutes. Um, so keep it in mind while you're listening. Um, so the schedule, so once I'm done talking, we'll listen to a presentation on social choice and decentralization possibilities offered from technology from Deb Thompson, our guest speaker for the day. Um, and then after that, we'll hear from those eight individuals that will present their poster slides, pitch deck, et cetera. And then after they present, we'll wrap up with questions and call it a day. And so with that said, I would love to welcome our guest speaker, Deb Thompson, um, the Vice President of Strategy and Operations at Luna. Um, she's filling in today for Ian Terry, but she is highly, highly qualified to talk about our topic of the day, which is social choice and the decentralization possibilities offered from technology. Um, I'm very excited. I know for everyone from Jeanette Alliance is very excited to have her here. Um, so Deb, whenever you are ready. Thanks, George. I really appreciate you uh, letting me fill in for Ian. And I'll just give a, a quick uh, other shout out for Ian Terry, who's our head of user research at Luna, but he's also the creator of the kind of methodology that I'm going to share today. So um, he's very sorry he couldn't be here, but he had the opportunity to take a vacation with his family. And we all know that's been in short supply the last uh, couple of years. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get going. All right, can you guys see the slides okay? Great. So Georgia already did my introduction for me. So what we're gonna talk about today is around social choice and decentralizing research, but the end goal is really around accelerating the right research that matters the most to those that are affected by a specific condition or disease. And the method that Ian developed is what we call community-driven innovation. So what we kind of say when we're thinking about decentralizing the setting of priorities for research is that communities need a seat at the table. And one of the key tables that you need a seat at is a table where the focus of the research is decided. And right now, a lot of times that's happening somewhere in a pharmaceutical company, in an academic researcher, where they just think of some idea that's just interesting to them. But you need that seat at the table because you know and the people in your communities know what matters most to you. So how do you extract what matters most to you and what matters most to the people in your community? That's what we wanna talk about today. And I just put this quote up here because I, I really liked it um, from Shirley who was the first black woman in Congress back in 1968. She basically said, they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair and make your seat at the table. So we're really focused on trying to help you figure out how to bring that folding chair and put it at the table to make sure that you have that voice. So how do we do that? How do we extract that information from our communities to really understand what matters most? Everybody has their ideas. There are different processes that exist today um, that have been used in the past and are still being used today. I'm not gonna go in depth on this. I think uh, Caitlin is speaking a little bit later and she'll be giving you some use cases around this, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a high level overview of what's sort of going on today and how this is different. Um, so first thing is that focus groups are used a lot today where you get a group of people together and you ask them questions so that you can gather their priorities. But that's really not the best way to do this. And why? Because groupthink is really bad. It introduces all kinds of bias. You're always gonna have those people that are very vocal and shout out their ideas. You're gonna have shy people that are just gonna sit there quietly and absorb. And you're gonna have people that may have spoken up, 
but those really vocal people kind of skew the conversation towards things that they might not have said. So their like top priorities are hidden behind, behind someone else's top priorities. Um, and then the Delphi process is another process out there that's actually you know, very rigorous in terms of what it does, but they have a concept of only listening to these presumed experts. So who are these experts? Why are they experts? And why do they know more than what you know and what the people in your communities know? So that's why we need to kind of turn this on its head a little bit and change the process so that we can really make it something that's gathering the right insights. And so that's where uh, community-driven innovation comes in. So this is kind of the framework for how community-driven innovation works. There's several different uh, kind of phases for it. Uh, at the core, it's a bottom-up iterative process and it starts with identifying the space. So what is the space that we're interested in? In uh, these situations, it could be the condition, the disease, the families and people that are affected by the condition and how their day-to-day -day life happens, how they're managing through, what they're talking about, what they're discussing, what's important to them. So we listen. That's the first thing is we listen and we identify and we frame the space. Then we start the design phase. And that's where we're really starting to develop the hierarchy of needs. And I'll go into all this in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. And the third phase is we measure. So how successful is that design? How successful were we at listening and understanding? And then we iterate, iterate, iterate. You never want this process to stop. You want to continuously be listening and learning because your design and how you measure that design tells you where your gaps are, how it relates and aligns to research, how new things that might become priorities later might fit into that framing of the space that you created. And, and subsequently, and your end goal is inform research. So you wanna continuously be doing this listening, designing, measuring to understand where the priorities really need to be. So let's go into that in just a little bit more detail. Yeah. So first, as we're kind of framing the space, we're listening and how do we do that? So we like one-on-one -on -one interviews versus that focus group. We might actually send out questionnaires that are filled out by individuals. We do some online listening where people are talking. So in Facebook groups, for example, uh, we do just typical types of market research where we're looking digitally to try to understand what's going on in the space. And then we throw science at it. So. Uh, Ian likes to talk about a lot of really uh, scientific methods that are used and that are at the core of this methodology. I'm going to try to bring it down a level to make it a little bit easier to understand. Um, he, we do what we call factor analysis, but really what that means is we take the patterns from these lists that are generated of topics. What are the topics that are being discussed in the space? And we look for patterns. We look for overlaps. And we try to take what is typically a very large list of topics that are being discussed probably somewhere between 200 and 500 different topics for a single space. And we try to shrink it to a more manageable data set. And we do that using these patterns. And two of the type of mathematical theories that are at the core of this are set theory and node theory. And again, those are just things that are looking at the interconnections between these topics, the patterns between these uh, topics, how these topics relate to each other. And so set theory at its core is like a Venn diagram of how these different things relate. And no theory is about the interconnections between these topics. And so we apply that kind of um, analysis to these lists, to what we've listened and heard from people in the space. And that creates this manageable list of about 50 to 150 topics that are the most uh, often discussed things in this space, in your community, in this um, area of this condition. And so then we ask the people in the community to take a look at this list. And what does that look like? Basically, we create what is a, a survey that asks you to rank these different topics. So we tell you, you have like 150 topics and you have to find your top five priorities in under five minutes and people freak out that they only have five minutes. And we do that on purpose. We want your gut reaction. And I love something that Ian always says. He says, we're activating your lizard brain. And that's, we're trying to get at your immediate reactions to what is most important to you as you're looking through this list of 150 topics in this space. 
And we want to know which are your top five priorities. We don't want you to overthink it, which is why we put the time restriction on it. We want it to be your immediate reaction because your immediate reaction is what's most top of mind and most important for you. And different from that Delphi process that we mentioned before, we don't just want to hear from the experts. We want to hear from everybody, people that are affected by the condition, caregivers, family, friends, physicians. Everybody should have a voice that lives in this space. And what's the result of that? Out of that comes what we call top tasks. So this is where we really understand the priorities from the space. So typically you have anywhere from say 50 to thousands of people uh, responding to this from your community, depending on what the size of your community is. And depending on the size of your community, that minimum number that's required for statistical significance, we can get to. So the top five to say 10 items that are your top tasks are what gets 25% of the vote. And typically you have these top tasks that are again, five to 10 of the tasks from that list of 150, they get 25% of the vote. Then you have these middle tasks, which are about 50% of the vote. They're typically things that are supported by or eclipsed by the top tasks. There might be some relevance to them. There might be some overlap, but we'll figure that out as a next step. And then you have a bunch of these tiny tasks. There's typically about 50 or more tiny tasks that get the same amount of vote as those top five to 10 tasks. Tiny tasks are things that, that every community struggles with. They typically are the squeaky wheel. They take a lot of energy. Sometimes they actually block a top task. So you have to handle a tiny task in order to do a top task. Um, and other times they're just in the way because the squeaky wheel is getting the most notice. Um, so you, we wanna get to the point where, where you as a community have heard from everybody in your community. They aren't biased because they're each contributing this information individually. And you now know what these top five to 10 priorities are. And in this example from a Phoenix study that Ian worked on uh, on COVID, there were exactly five, but we've seen anywhere from five to 10. Now, at this point, you've unlocked your top priorities. You know things that you need to kind of look at. You can kind of see some of the relationships. You could stop here in the CDI. You already have a ton of really beneficial and actionable information. What you can do just with this information is develop studies to investigate those top tasks. You could create surveys to go after more details on those top tasks. You can also reframe old studies to communicate the findings that are aligned to this new value hierarchy. So this is what matters most. This is the, what, the, what people in your community value most in understanding better. And so a great example that Ian has given before around reframing old studies is there was a, a study on PXC that was really focused on lesions and calcifications. But a lot of people didn't really understand what do you mean you're looking at lesions and calcifications? But they understood what loose skin was. That was one of their top priorities, one of the things that came out as their top priorities. And as it, as it happens, the lesions and the calcifications are actually uh, a cause of the loose skin. So if you reframe the study in terms of the loose skin and correlate it to the calcifications and the lesions, they now understand better why that was a priority, why it was important to do. And kind of um, adding on to that, you can also add better communication back to your communities around the message, around the studies, around anything, because now you understand how your how the members of your communities think, what their mental model is. So you can uh, understand that they use certain terms more often than other terms. They're concerned about these certain things more often. So you can adapt your, commu your communication and your own priorities as an as a advocacy foundation to help that. So even just at this phase, you've already gotten a lot of extremely useful information. And those priorities can also be used to help inform research goals when you talk to pharmaceutical companies or academic collaborators. But you don't have to stop here. So what else can you do? What are the next steps in the CDI? As Ian likes to say, you can go up or you can go down from the top tasks. If you go up, you're trying to understand the relationships between the tasks. So you can do what's called a dendrogram study. 
And in this uh, case, what you're doing is you're looking at the relationship between the top tasks and the middle tasks. So you're asked again, as members of the community, to look at the list of just the top and middle tasks and start to bucket them into categories. You don't have to make up names of the categories. You can call it bucket one, bucket two, bucket three, or you can take up names. You can make up names if you want to. That's less important. What's important is that you're saying that topic A, topic B, topic Z are all something that you consider related and that you would bucket them together. And so what you end up with is this kind of tree where you can see some kind of medium level uh, buckets and then some of your bigger buckets. And that helps you understand how your community thinks about these topics in relationship to each other. And one kind of practical application of that is when you think about your information architecture on your website. So even just building out your advocacy's website, you now know in this example from the Phoenix study, they now know that stress, substance abuse, and a couple other things were all tied together as related in the minds of their members. So whenever they build out aspects of their website related to those topics, they either need to be in the same area or they need to be linked to so that people can go from one to the other because in their minds, they're gonna to wanna to go from one to the other very easily. So that's just one example of a practical application of this type of binning. It also helps you see the different ways that people may talk about the same topic. So um, for example, the PXE study that I just mentioned, one of your uh, tasks that you were doing the top tasks for could have been calcifications of the skin. And another one could have been loose skin. They're related and this would have shown how related they were. And then you would be able to, again, adapt your communication, adapt your studies, adapt how you talk about that when you're talking to researchers and your community. So we went up from the top tasks. Now we can also go down from the top tasks. And this is uh, where we're talking about what are the outcomes related to the top tasks that you're most concerned about. So this is going one layer deeper and really understanding that topic in more detail. So this is an example from a women's health priority study that we did where we did a CDI. And we found that uh, certain topics were of more interest to them than others, the top tasks. One of those was menstruation and understanding more about menstruation. And so we, what we do is we work with the community to create outcome statements. In this case, an example is um, an outcome statement around the topic of menstruation is we want to reduce the stigma around menstruation. And so we create a whole bunch of these outcome statements. And then the community is asked to do two things related to each outcome statement. Rank it in terms of how important that outcome statement is to them. So in this example, how important is it to you that we spend time reducing the stigma around menstruation. And second, they also have to rank how well served or underserved do you think that outcome is? So how much effort is already being ex expended around reducing that stigma? How well has that stigma been reduced type of thing? And so what you'll end up with is this kind of four quadrant chart where things that are the most important and the most underserved end up in your top left. And those topics you know are the things that in more detail related to those topics are the most important things that your community wants focused on and what they believe is also the most underserved today. So a, a very clear indication of some unmet needs in the, in the community. And so what do we do with all of this information? You've gathered all of these insights, you understand your community better, better than you ever did before, what does that mean? So what can you do with this all? So we talked about a couple of these things already. You can design custom surveys. You now know the topics, even just from the top tasks that are the most important for you to drill down more and understand more of the experiences from your community. You can develop validated instruments. <clears throat> and we work with um, groups that can help validate instruments very quickly. Why are validated instruments so important? Because whenever you get to the point where you're going to be working with a pharma to submit, they're going to want to look at something that's data collected in a scientifically rigorous manner. Validated instruments are created to test the quality, the reproducibility, and the inclusiveness of the language used in those surveys. So getting that type of help can be really important. And now you know the exact topics and even details of those topics that you need to focus on. 
You can also create resources for your community around those high priority topics. So maybe it's not, not necessarily something specifically related to research, but it's just an area where you know there's resources available, but your members haven't been able to find them. Now you can make that more available on your website. You can also generate abstracts and statistics. And actually now you can proactively build like a pitch deck or a, a bunch of information that you can provide to pitch to your academic or industry partners to say, look, this is what we understand about our community. These are places where they're gonna be the most engaged to enroll in your studies and help you find these answers. And you can actually translate those priorities into secondary endpoints and clinical trials. It's gonna be really hard to make them primary endpoints because the FDA pushes back a lot on that if there's not established evidence around those as primary endpoints. But if they're secondary endpoints, that's great. And you build up that body of evidence. So you're finding these ways to make what matters most to your community be the focus of research. And you guys are the ones that understand your communities the best. So by listening to them and by presenting this in a scientifically rigorous manner, you're going to look extremely credible and know that your participants, that your members in your community are gonna be engaged to support these types of studies. So that's CDI today. There's other things that we're focusing on to try to take community-driven innovation to the next level and to really help you make the most of this. Um, so one, we're focused on ways of improving the efficiency and scalability of the process. Um, Ian and his team have spent a lot of time this year looking at different ways to get to this information where it's still high quality and statistically significant. And so we're hoping to roll those out over the course of this year. But then there's always the issue with funding. Like how do we make sure that we can afford doing these CDIs? How do we afford to get the help to get data scientists to help us look at some of this information and, and create those analyses that will help us attract research partners? Um, and sometimes you'll get volunteers and sometimes you won't. So we're exploring some of the crowdfunding strategies that are really popular today and can be really easily done to get the small amounts of money that you need to support this type of a project. And then, of course, hey, Deb, um, you got about done? you got about 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I have these two bullets and I'm done. So we're good. Um, and then, of course, you want to translate the findings into simple, shareable industry pitches. So you might need help with that as well. And so we're looking at ways to kind of give guidance there as well. And again, just to sum it all up, this is to make sure that you and your community have a seat at the table. And honestly, our end goal is for you to have a seat at the head of the table so that you're driving where the research is going. So hopefully that was, was still a couple minutes left for questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. So we don't have time for questions now, um, but hopefully we will at the end. Um, and I'm sure Deb can drop her email um, in the chat. Um, but actually we have probably, we could take about like two questions if anyone has them. I have a question. Maybe I missed this part, but Deb, regarding the CDI process, it sounds like it's a multi-step process. Our organization went through the first step and I guess there's a second step that goes in deeper. Can you explain that a little bit, phase two? Sure, so yeah, you guys went through the uh, framing of the space and the top tasks. And then I think where you didn't do is you didn't take the next step to either the dendrogram studies or the outcome statements, which is, either going up to understand the relationship between the different top tasks and the immediate middle tasks. So to really understand how they correlate with each other. And you didn't go deeper to really understand within those top tasks, what are the outcomes that your community is most concerned with. So in either case, it's just a simple uh, next step where uh, a one action required of your community so uh, Ian or his team would work with you guys to decide which way you wanna go based on your goals or if you wanna go in both ways. And then um, in the case of the dendrogram, it can be an immediate thing, no additional action from the, the community leaders. You would just build out the dendrogram study and invite your members to complete it, which is basically bucketing those um, tasks. Or if you go to the outcome statements, he would work with you to generate the list of outcome statements. And then it would be basically another survey back to your participants to complete the survey and rank those outcome statements based on 
how, what's most important and what's most underserved. Great, thanks. Any more questions before we move on? Well, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, um, so now we will hear from our groups. Um, we're actually going to start with Tim from Xcures. Um, and while Matthew pulls that up, um, just as a reminder again for peers and audience members, um, if you have a question, that was perfect during Deb's conversation, uh, feel free to throw it in the chat or ask it at the end. Um, so yeah, y'all can start whenever you are ready. All right, thank you very much for um, opportunity to present. So um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And um, everyone can see the presentation slide? Yes. Yes, OK, great. Um, so um, uh, my name is Tim Stumiller. Uh, I'm uh, from Xcures. And so Xcures is a health technology and clinical research company. Um, and uh, we have a central IRB approved research protocol, essentially through Genetic Alliance that we really leverage for a lot of what we try to do. Um, and so, you know, we were, we're a for-profit company, but we were born out of a patient advocacy group. And so a lot of what we do really has an eye towards um, patients and we're um, in the oncology space. Uh, and so um, I'm going to explain a little bit about sort of what we've built to date. Um, the company is about three years old. Um, and uh, then I'll go into some research that we've done. And so, you know, Excelsior, which is the name of our protocol, uh, is really a nationwide pan cancer uh, longitudinal outcomes registry. Uh, it's patient driven um, and patients can e consent, it's totally virtual. Um, and as part of this, separately, there's a participation agreement where um, they offer up to us access to their medical records under HIPAA third-party right of access. And so what we do, um, essentially, in, in blending these things together in observational research, as well as access to the patient's medical records, um, is we've built this platform where um, we take the source documents uh, from their medical records and abstract that data into a um, electronic data capture system uh, according to good clinical practices. And so, you know, essentially what we're trying to do in, in sort of uh, this protocol and the process is to get as close to a clinical trial as possible, clinical trial grade data, just from the standard practice of medicine. Uh, and so this opens up, you know, a lot of different avenues for what we can do with this platform. And so I'll, I'll explain to you um, just sort of what we're trying to do. Um, so these three main bullets are really, you know, it's a very patient centric. So when patients sign up, uh, we've actually built an online portal where they can sign up and um, access uh, longitudinal structured data. And we have a team of PhD scientists um, that I'm in charge of that uh, basically do some research for them. Uh, most of these patients are advanced cancer patients. And so they're sort of looking for options at a late stage of disease. Um, and, you know, on the other side, we're digitizing basically the entire medical record. Uh, it's clinic notes, pathology, radiology. And so, you know, what we're able to do is do research across patients across the country um, but also um, to uh, essentially unlock some AI and machine learning. Um, that's sort of like the next stage of where we're going with our platform. Um, and so, you know, this is a very complex slide, um, but it's essentially how we look at the platform. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's basically pa cancer patients we get from a, many different places. Uh, they can e-consent. We don't require any institutional EMR integration uh, in the way that we have access to the records. We structure them, we can do some real world data analytics, and we're building some decision support algorithms based on basically the, the actual raw real world data. 
And uh, we can also host tumor boards to support these patients. Um, and you know, ultimately, this information is fed back to them in patient portals and provider portals. Um, and you know, the real core aspect of what we're trying to do now um, is that Excelsior, as this sort of patient-centric observational research protocol, um, we can layer on top of this interventional studies. Uh, and so as sort of a clinical research organization, that's what we're start starting to do with some um, pharma and diagnostic clients, is to run expanded access programs, decentralized trials, and otherwise. Uh, and so this is sort of the, the platform as we see it um, in a large way. And so the last bit, I'll kind of go over a use case that we have in aggregating this data. And so we really started in primary CNS cancers, uh, glioblastoma and otherwise. Um, and so right now we've uh, recruited about 3,000 total patients um, with advanced cancer over the past three years. Uh, glioblastoma is the largest cohort now. Uh, and so the analytics I'm going to provide are a few months old, um, but not they're, they're still quite relevant to kind of where we're going. Um, and so, you know, this is as of the fall. Uh, you know, 556 patients with CNS cancer and 425 that we've essentially annotated their longitudinal data. Um, and this is a little over a year median follow-up time from diagnosis. Um, but again, CNS cancers are extremely aggressive. So this is actually fairly complete data. Um, this is just a plot of where they're coming, uh, how many patients have enrolled and sort of the institutions where they've been treated. You can see that we're getting patients from essentially all the major academic medical centers. And so that's another really uh, interesting aspect of this is that, you know, we're able to work with patients from all of these different centers and sort of understand treatment patterns across uh, multiple institutions. Uh, and this is really just kind of digging into the glioblastoma data specifically. Um, and so, you know, we're able to look at sort of where are the tumor locations um, for glioblastoma patients? Um, what's the median age when they're uh, initially diagnosed? Um, here is just looking at their biomarkers um, sort of uh, across the country. And so, you know, on enrollment, when glioblastoma patients come to us, 63% have already received next generation sequencing. Um, and this is just sort of the breakdown in the different either commercial or um, other academic labs where they might have gotten NGS done. Um, and, you know, this is, again, just sort of a long tail plot showing that the categories and the frequency of all these different alterations. Um, and, you know, we standardize this on the back end so that we can compare um, different types of alterations from different testing sites. Um, and, you know, we're obviously, this is a, a really critical thing for advanced cancer patients. And so we're in active discussions with many different um, NGS and other diagnostic providers to, to bring more widespread access and just information, education, really, to patients. Uh, and so here's some of the interesting analytics that we were able to do um, on this data set. And so this is just a standard Cox proportional hazard ratio analysis uh, across the um, cohort. Uh, specifically glioblastoma. And so, you know, you'll see that advanced age um, is a risk factor and MGMT methylation is a um, positive indicator of uh, long-term survival. So this is, um, you know, these are sort of controls and you can see the, the survival plot over here. Uh, but we also found that uh, loss of ATRX, a particular biomarker, uh, is um, not favorable or, or is, is uh, um, uh, detrimental, but also if patients received a immune checkpoint inhibitor, that they had a positive um, overall survival benefit from that. And so um, I'll dig into that in a little bit. Um, but also, you know, this is another unique aspect of glioblastoma treatment is that a lot of doctors use uh, uh, therapies off-label or in different combinations or expanded access. And so in our data set, 20% of patients were treated with a, a therapy um, outside of uh, indication. And a lot of these were targeted therapies, obviously. The most common were checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and so this is the overall plot. If you look at all of the patients uh, with glioblastoma, if they were not treated with a checkpoint inhibitor or if they were treated, and you can see that you know, the, the tail is, is definitely coming up on the, the, the overall survival here. And if we try to create a matched cohort of these, again, you see that we're, we're raising the long tail here. We're seeing, seeing that it's raised just from uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. Here's some statistics just to try to balance uh, sort of what we're looking at. 
And I put this in red down the bottom um, because it's really, you know, patients who are treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, off-label brain cancer, it's not just that that they're pursuing. It's actually many different regimens and combinations of things. And so, um, you know, this is as of, um, again, a few months ago, uh, 33 patients. Now, I think we probably have about 60 or so that have been treated. And so what we want to do is start to slice and stratify, you know, this patient population and sort of try to balance some of this stuff better. So patients who had a complete resection versus, you know, just look at all MGMT methylated patients versus unmethylated, as these are the major sort of um, uh, uh, risk factors. And so um, I'm going to um, skip to the end. Um, oh, I have one, one more slide, sorry. So as part of this, we also ran tumor boards. Um, and so this is just some general stats on our tumor boards that we've run and you know, just sort of starting to look at some utility data of what we can do for the patients and um, sort of looking more sort of long-term, you know, how did the patients do that chose a, an option that our tumor board suggested to them um, and otherwise. And this was done in collaboration with Cancer Commons and the Musella Foundation, a couple advocacy groups. So um, with that, I will stop. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. We've got about like 40 seconds for any questions if anyone wants to ask. It was a great presentation, thank you. Thank you. I just have a comment while um, people think about if they have a question, and that is, uh, while certainly lots of you are not involved with cancer, there are overlaps, obviously, in what Tim said, and I'm just using that as an example as we go throughout the presentations today to see, okay, that's not exactly my thing, but where can I uh, engage in a similar way, or what kinds of questions can I ask my community that might, in fact, ferret out some of these associations? And there's one question in the chat, Georgia, I don't know if you wanna read that. Yeah, um, Tim, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so 55% so had um, additional treatments. How many additional treatments are typical in this patient population? And so, um, you know, that's a really good question and something that we wanna dive into is looking at combination regimens. Um, because, um, you know, it, it's very, very common in advanced cancer that, um, again, this is where the whole precision oncology concept comes from, is let's find some biomarkers and try to target those biomarkers. Um, and, you know, with checkpoint inhibitors now, that's kind of revolutionized treatment. And what they've done is just said, well, let's put a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with this, right? Because they can be, you know, not, not terribly toxic and maybe boosting your immune system is going to help you. And so um, you know, there's something that's a really good question is how many patients are actually being treated with combinations versus just a single agent. Um, and I would imagine um, in glioblastoma, um, I would say it's significantly less than 55% um, in general. And so I think it is these patients, I have to look at the data, um, but it's definitely these patients who are pursuing a checkpoint inhibitor, like they are looking for other things that are also going to help them. And so it's, it's a very activated patient population versus just standard of care. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, and we have Amanda Brown next from GPAC. Matthew wants to, or Amanda, if you wanted to share that yourself or Matthew pulled up. Okay, I can share my screen. Got it. Okay, perfect. All right, are you seeing it okay? Great. All right, well, I'm very excited for this opportunity to tell you about one of our studies. I'm Amanda Brown. I'm the Director of Research for GPACT, which is the Gastroparesis Patient Association for Cures and Treatments. So we've been able to complete a few studies from our data registry. We've published uh, the Journal of Nurse Practitioners. We've been able to present at the Cleveland Clinic. So getting this information out 
regarding our underserved community has been very impactful. So what I'd like to do today is I'm going to share one of our studies, delayed gastric emptying and symptom variation. So a little background, gastroparesis, it's a chronic gastrointestinal motility disorder that's diagnosed by delayed gastric emptying and the absence of a mechanical obstruction. So normal gastric functioning requires a coordination of certain nerves and muscles. And if there's any disconnect or damage to any of the nerves and muscles involved in the digestive process, the digestion throughout the system is then slowed. So medical providers can confirm a diagnosis of gastroparesis after doing a thorough clinical evaluation. And this can include obtaining a patient history, discussing reported symptoms, and ordering a few tests. So for delayed gastric emptying, the gold standard is a gastric emptying scan. And this test requires a patient to ingest a radio tracer low-fat meal consisting of two radio-labeled large eggs, white bread, jelly, and water. Once ingested, imaging is performed at zero, one, two, and four hours to track the meal as it moves through the digestive tract. So the level of delayed emptying is then determined by the percentage of food that remains in the stomach after two or four hours, and four hours is the most accurate test. So this concept will be important as we get into the results of the study, but symptoms of gastroparesis can vary depending on the level of severity. So it's estimated that 267.7 per 100,000 persons in the United States population are diagnosed with gastroparesis. And two of the main etiologies are idiopathic, meaning the cause is unknown, and diabetic, but there can also be other causes such as viral neurological complications from gastrointestinal surgery and different types of medications can also lead to gastroparesis. Um, symptoms typically associated with gastroparesis are nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, postprandial fullness, and upper abdominal discomfort. And symptoms can vary for patient to patient regardless of the underlying cause. So a few of the, a review of the literature indicated that there's not a significant correlation between symptom severity and gastric emptying acceleration. Individuals can experience mild um, symptoms, but have severely delayed emptying times, and some may experience severe symptoms and test for a mild delay. So the association of delayed gastric emptying and symptoms is not clear. So the aim of our study was to determine if symptoms vary based on the severity of gastric emptying and we use data from our gastroparesis registry. The registry was available to more than 35 countries. It had a response rate of more than 1,000 participants who either had gastroparesis or were caring for an individual with gastroparesis. And the registry was designed to gain an in-depth understanding of both the physical and psychological symptoms of gastroparesis. And from the 1,000 participants who completed the registry, data were abstracted based on the inclusion criteria and results were presented as percentage retained. So individuals who received a six hour study were also included to open the scope for comparison. Um, participants' results were then separated into categories of severity. So there's mild, moderate, severe, and then the six hours severe. So the basis for each category was determined by the percentage of re retained. So 10 to 15% retained is mild, 16 to 34% is moderate, and 35% or greater is severe. And there was a total of 124 registry participants that met this inclusion. And 72 were severe, 31 were moderate, nine were mild, and 12 were six hours severe. So after participants were separated into groups, the most severe symptoms were pulled from the registry and ranked, and then descriptive statistics were used to compare and determine the symptom relationships. So an interesting finding from the study was that participants in the moderate emptying time group experienced a higher percentage of early satiety, food intolerance, lack of appetite, and weight loss. And the moderate group also had the greatest percentage of individuals that had a BMI of or below 18.5. And a BMI below 18.5 is considered underweight. So this suggests that individuals who retained 16% to 34% of the meal after four hours are more likely to experience malnutrition and be underweight. And individuals who retained 35% or more after six hours experienced a higher percentage of vomiting, which also had the largest percentage of participants with BMIs greater than 29. So BMI greater to or equal than 29 is considered overweight to obese. So this study indicates that vomiting and reflux are experienced with slower emptying times, but it's the food intolerance and lack of appetite that has the greatest impact on weight. So individuals who retain food longer experience a greater percentage of reflux, but were able to tolerate food and a lack of appetite 
was not as severe as it was for those with faster emptying times. Participants in the six hour severe group also experienced greater percentages of weight gain. So this suggests that slower emptying times do not correlate with weight loss for closing that symptoms do vary based on emptying times. And those with moderate gastric emptying times are at greater risk for weight loss and should be monitored closely. So there were too few participants who were receiving nutritional supplement through tubes or TPN to warrant this being a factor in the loss and weight gain symptoms. Um, another interesting finding is that fatigue was rated in the top three most severe symptoms by all levels of emptying times and second overall being nausea. So this provides evidence that symptoms vary based on emptying times and those with slower emptying times do not experience weight loss to the extent of those with moderate emptying times. So the study also suggested that fatigue is a severe symptom of those with gastroparesis and significantly affects the participants. And those in the mild group expressed high percentages of abdominal pain and bloating and the mild group also had the highest percentage of those experiencing fatigue. So this does show a relationship between fatigue, abdominal pain, at least satiety and bloating. So further research is needed to determine the cause of fatigue and determine whether it should be added to the diagnosis process as well as treatment management, getting a better understanding into why certain symptoms affect those at different levels of emptying. And this is important for the healthcare providers. So thanks to our registry, we now have a better understanding of symptoms which can guide best practice and improve the overall quality of life for our patients. Sorry if I was talking very fast. There's just a lot of content. I wanted to get it all out there. <laughs> Any questions? All righty. Well, thank you. Oh, we have one. So we have a question from Gigi. Do you see the chat? Um, yeah. Are you continuing to track these people over time? If yes, how many people have developed Parkinson's disease? So we don't track them over time. I could, I will get back to you about your Parkinson's disease. I can pull that up right now and we'll see. I don't know if they develop because we have another study where we looked at comorbidities. So let me find that answer for you. And then I will get back to you by, before we are done with today's symposium. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Great, next we have Kat from PXC. Um, I know, Kat, you wanted to share your screen. Yep. You're ready to start whenever. Okay. Do you guys see that okay? So hi, everyone. I'm Kat Troutman, and I'm the research manager for PXC International. And today I just wanted to share some of our novel preliminary findings from our registry. Oh, there we go. So we sent surveys in 1998, 2008, and 2015 to the individuals who are part of our registry. The surveys asked the same base set of questions, which enabled us to combine the responses from all three of them to use as one data set. Some individuals participated in more than one survey, which is awesome, but we had to eliminate those duplicate submissions. The earliest survey that the individuals responded to was kept in the data set with our thinking being it would be the most accurate since there were questions that required the individuals to, to recall a certain age that something happened. So if a person submitted the 2008 and 2015 survey, the 2008 responses were included. And then if they did all three of them, then the 1998 responses were used. So then how many participants did this leave us with? 1,614. We were able to have a participant pool of 1,614 individuals. PXC is a rare condition, so being able to have this high particip participation rate is absolutely phenom phenomenal, and it only strengthens our findings. So I can break the base survey that we investigated into three main categories, symptom onset, 
symptom severity, and novel symptoms. We wanted to look into symptom onset and severity to try to understand a timeline on how PXC develops and progresses, but we also wanted to look in the possibility that there may be some aspects of the condition that we are not even aware of, and this is what I wanted to focus on today. In particular, the incidence of gastrointestinal bleeding and heart disease in individuals with PXC. So before diving deeper, I want to briefly show just how massive this study was. It resulted in an 80 page document and I've included just a few of the tables and figures in this slide and the next one for you to just look at. So now on to the particular results. In the surveys, we asked if an individual had experienced gastrointestinal bleeding before, and a total of 1,145 individuals responded with 233 of them confirming they have experienced GI bleeding. That's roughly a quarter of the respondents. So we compared this, compared this to the general population, which led to some difficulty since incident rates are broken down into upper and lower GI bleeds. So to combat this, we ran our proportion against the incident rates for both in a chi-square test. For upper GI bleeds, we received a p-value of 0.001, and lower GI bleeds resulted in 0.001, showing that our incident rate was significantly greater compared to the general population. So this was actually the first time that gastrointestinal bleeding in individuals with PXC has been investigated on a large level, so our results are truly novel. So the next surprising result came from investigating the prevalence of heart disease. We asked if the individuals have been diagnosed with heart disease and 173 people out of 571 responded that they have. This put our prevalence rate at 37.7%, which compared to the 6.7% prevalence for the United States population, it just seemed significantly greater, but we still ran it through a chi-square test and got back a 0.00%. 0 of 1 p-value, once again, receiving strong significant results. So then how do we tackle this going forward? The biggest thing we need to do is more research, always, always more research. We need to complete multiple studies looking into the prevalence and inc incidence of these potentially novel sy symptoms and more to determine if they need to be considered symptoms of PXC or if they are just comorbidities. Two ways we plan on doing this is by developing more surveys and also looking at individual medical records to confirm diagnosis and allowing for a more accurate analysis. So this study could not have been done without the PXE International Registry. Our registry data has already resulted in new guidelines for individuals with PXE in regards to mammography, urology in males, nephrology, and many others. It has also helped to develop clinical trials and will be the historical control for our natural history study that is currently in development. And as we continue our research, we will only be adding more guidelines, more papers, and more discoveries to this list, showing just how strong a registry can be for organizations like all of us. I want to thank everyone for listening. And does anyone have any questions? Hi, Kat. Um, do you know if there's like a genetic or environmental um, determinant or cause behind the reason why some experience bleeding and some don't? Or, or is this still under research? That's still under research. And that would be actually something we look into in our further research. Mm -hmm. Kat, I have a question. This is Andy from Timothy Syndrome Foundation. I noticed with the cardiac symptoms that you only have about 500 responses. Um, does that mean people are just not answering that question and your numbers are really more dilute or you only had 500 responses at that one time? People had the option of skipping questions. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, because some might have just skipped the question entirely. The answers might have been, um, like when cleaning the data set, they might have just been off in general. So that's why each question had its own particular end value for that reason. Thank you.
Yeah, great job, Kat. Um, uh, does anyone have any more questions? If not, we will move on to Caitlin. Hi, okay, hold on one second, let me share. Well, maybe not, maybe I won't share. Oh man, that's gonna be awful. <laughs> um, all right. Well then, I'm sorry, Matthew, can you share my slides? Certainly, let me see if I've got this in the right view. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be able to advance them, right? Correct. Just prompt <laughs> me and I will. I will do my best to give you a, no a nod. So, all right. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Esposito. I work for the Chiari and Stringamayelia Foundation. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some exciting projects we're working on with, in partnership with Luna DNA and Genetic Alliance. Uh, using the methodology that Deb was talking about earlier. Um, so some real world examples. Next slide. So at this point, most academics would probably agree with this. The way we do traditional medical research is pretty antiquated. It's done in silos, both academic and disciplinary. Consensus processes and the accumulation of clinical literature can take years. Ultimately, drug and treatment development can take decades. So there's been a recent push to be a little bit more patient centric in all of this, uh, but as of right now, frankly, um, the voice, the patient voice seems to kind of been layered on top of this already bureaucratic and complex system, and it hasn't really been integrated fully. So we hope that what we're going to talk about today will help start to shift that paradigm in a really meaningful way. Next slide. Okay, so today I'm gonna to present two use cases that we're working on. Um, we plan to use TDI methodology that was previously described by Deb. We're hopeful that we can use it to meaningfully improve upon the existing evidence-based methodologies. And I'll talk about them right now, next slide. So we propose that CDI can be used to improve Delphi consensus and FDA required patient-focused drug development meetings for pharmaceutical and medical device development. I'm going to briefly describe these processes, even though a lot of you probably already know, and then I'll explain how and why we believe CDI specifically can make these processes more fast, efficient, inexpensive, and efficacious overall. Next slide. The first tradi traditional research process we're going to test is Delphi for topical consensus. Uh, Delphi was originally developed by the RAND Corporation. It has a lot of applications far beyond clinical research and practice. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to talk about this process in terms of consensus building in the specific situation of cranial cervical instability or CCI. Next slide. Okay, so by means of a quick background, cranial cervical instability is sometimes found in patients with Chiari malformation, syringomyelia. It's highly controversial clinical area. The medical liter literature is severely lacking. The personal experience of the treating doctor typically determines the diagnosis and treatment. Often, it is not a standard part of a Chiari differential diagnosis, which can prove problematic. Um, surgery for CCI is fundamentally different than surgery for Chiari or syringomyelia alone. And what's worse, if CCI is not appropriately treated or identified before a decompression surgery, there can actually be bad outcomes or repeat surgeries. So some patients end up doctor shopping to find a physician who will confirm or deny the diagnosis. And all of this is messy and it leads to mistrust from all parties. So there's a real clear need for a consensus in this area. Next slide. So to facilitate that, we had begun working with a group of clinicians on a traditional Delphi process. This slide shows a really simplified version of that. In general, it involves an initial literature review or interview if there's no data. Uh, various topics are identified as important, questions are formed, and there's a feedback loop that kind of goes back and forth for a couple of rounds, at least two usually. Um, and then a final round of like a meeting where these people get together and they talk about more of the more contentious topics to come to consensus on those. This process can take several months to a year. Next slide. 
So simultaneously, what we're planning to do is run a concurrent Delphi process using CDI. We're gonna include patients, caregivers, and clinicians and researchers who are interested in this. The process is gonna be pretty iterative as Deb um, mentioned, since it's gonna be so novel, but this is the general flow we're gonna be working with. The big difference between this and traditional Delphi is in the people we're including and really in the initial steps. Rather than exclusively working with experts and one or two patient advocates, we're gonna um, work with all of these uh, stakeholders. Then um, we're gonna have probably a remote meeting to discuss those processes, those areas of contention. But in the end, we expect to develop a consensus statement on the diagnosis, treatment, and management of CCI, which will be able to be stratified by that stakeholder based on the way we've set it up in the Luna system. Next slide. Um, we're expecting to have this done by September of this year, um, well before the traditional Delphi will be completed, which they're estimating December, but they're already behind, so I don't think so. Um, <laughs> the plan is to be fully transparent and publish these results regardless of the outcome. We plan to compare the outcome of both of these um, together, to, and we hypothesize that they're going to be similar, if not the same. But the CDI Delphi will have been completed faster, cheaper, and more efficiently. Why does this matter? Uh, we hope that this work will serve as a basis to expedite future consensus statements in disease spaces where evidence base might be lacking, but clinicians and patients need answers now. Next. So the second traditional research process we're planning to address is uh, patient-focused drug development. Next. So the FDI guidance that came out at the end of last year essentially requires this as opposed to suggesting it. Um, it was issued after 21st Century Cures. Uh, past meetings are publicly available, so I actually read through some of the summaries and watched some of the proceedings. And I'll say the meetings are really good. They um, include presentations from experts, real patient stories, issues related to everything under the sun. Um, and a summary is written following the meeting for use by any pharmaceutical or device company that's planning new treatments or devices in the disease space. Next slide. The traditional model can definitely be approved upon. Um, most obviously these meetings are constrained by time. So not everyone's story is gonna be feasible to get through. There's a finite number of patient stories that can be heard. Um, but using the CDI methodology, we are hopeful to include large amount of patients and caregivers with the same breadth and depth, the breadth and depth that are afforded to the select few that are invited to participate in these in-person meetings. Um, I'm gonna try and speed up. So this is important for disease spaces like ours. Chiari and Syringomyelia are often diagnosed alongside many comorbidities that color these individual perspectives and experiences. Recently, one of the doctors we work with said, if you've seen one patient with Chiari, you've seen one patient with Chiari. So they're highly individualized and a handful of patients' experiences is not gonna be enough to do a significant need assessment or gap analysis. Next slide. Um, the inclusion of comorbidities can also allow us to stratify needs by subgroups of patients. This might prove important because patients with certain constellations of symptoms are almost entirely different pathologies in our disease space. So for example, patients with Chiari and EDS may go undergo surgeries like spinal fusion, whereas patients with Chiari alone are usually only undergoing posterior fossa decompression. These are two entirely different surgeries and long-term management plans. And uh, it's likely that any drugs or devices are gonna target different symptoms or pathophysiologies. Next slide. It was a video, sorry. <laughs> um, more importantly, CDI has the potential to help address health inequities. Patients and caregivers who do not attend these meetings in general want, probably wanna contribute, but maybe they are not able to. They're not able to leave home, they're too sick. They can't afford travel. Maybe they don't trust the research infrastructure in general. A lot, there's a lot of different reasons, but CDI has the power to truly democratize participation in these processes. I'm going quickly. And <laughs> it's not bound by ge geography and it can be made accessible in many populations. Next slide. Um, okay, so it's our hope that we can employ the CDI methodology to replace the traditional PFDD meeting as it currently stands. We're estimating to begin this work uh, probably when we finish the previous one, so in late summer, and we'll launch probably in September or October of this year. Next slide. 
Our hypothesis is that we believe that we'll be able to produce a document that could be acceptable to the FDA in place of an expensive in-person or virtual PFDD meeting. And if this ends up being true, uh, the pharmaceutical and medical device companies will have a financial interest in working with patient advocacy groups engaged in this work. Next slide. <laughs> I'll make this one quick. So we wanna reiterate that this is a partnership. We wanna fundamentally change the way research is done. So as loud and as personally passionate as we are, we all might be individually, it's important to be realistic that that goal is not achievable unless we work together. So if we're trying to be persuasive um, it, and not waste finite resources in the process, we have to work together to create a body of work that's based in science. We have the ability to prove that patient-centered science is good science, so we have to do that. That's all, thank you. <laughs> So if you go to the very last slide, it has my info on it. Great. And we have about 30 seconds for any questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, you did great. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. And I believe we have Sarah from KCNT1 next. Sarah, did you want Matthew um, to share your, his screen or you present yours? Uh, can you, Ma Matthew can just put it up. Okay, perfect. It's a lot on one screen. This is a poster. I'm just going to present a poster that um, was accepted by the Orphan Drug Conference, which is next week. Um, so a um, little bit about our organization. We've um, been around for two years. We are a rare genetic epilepsy, and it is caused by a mutation in the KCNT1 gene, which is a gene that controls how neurons fire primarily in the brain, but also in the heart and muscles and various places of the body. So when pharma starts to develop drugs for this disorder, the first thing that they look at are seizures. And that is typically what they use for the endpoint in clinical trials, which we don't have any yet, but that is the plan. So it was very interesting to go through the CDI process and the pharmaceutical companies were very interested to see the results and find out that the number one concern of parents were the developmental delays of their children. So this, this, is, this information I think is going to elicit a lot of attention for our disease. So we put this poster together um, from the registry and we have two different uh, data collection tools within our registry. One was initially provided by a physician, Dr. David Bearden, who had a small registry at an academic center. And he gave us permission to contact those patients, gave us his initial survey. So that became the first um, instrument. And then Ian did the CDA process with a subset of our patients and developed the top tasks um, survey. So the participation numbers is different depending on the two surveys. So we have, even though we have 124 people with uh, Luna accounts, um, we only have 59 participate in the genetic epilepsy survey and only 36 in the top test survey. And so that's, those results are, some of those results are presented here. But um, so the important things were, as, like I said, that the top concerns were life expectancy seizures and developmental delays. Um, it's interesting to note that in the top task survey, some of the other concerns parent mentions most were um, prognosis. Um, and there was another term that were very, it was almost similar to life expectancy. So I'm anxious to go to the second level, the CDI and see how those buckets kind of will converge and then do another, go to the next level and have new in insights to provide to pharma and to our community. So um, really that's just, this is just presenting some of the top um, insights from the data, finding that um, most of the patients have seizures almost daily. Um, 
Most of the patients, over 67%, are severely delayed. Most of the patients have uh, seizures without fevers starting in the first few days of life. Um, and that's without fever is usually because fevers, when you have a seizure with a fever, it could indicate it's a different etiology um, rather than this genetic cause. Um, so as a, at a quick glance, you can see that most of the children eventually are tube fed only. They have such hypotonia that they can no longer um, have manage their swallowing. And the data is a bit skewed because most of the patients were of one phenotype. So we don't really have a good distribution of the three different phenotypes in here. So I had to, I thought that was important to put that on the slide so people could see that. Um, I didn't really know a good way to delineate the two different surveys in, in this poster, but I figured people can just ask questions. So anyways, um, that's all this is about, and we're excited to be part of the, the LUNA program and the CDI process, and i um, really excited to see what Caitlin does because I think um, Pharma would be willing to fund this uh, kind of activity. So that's all I have to share. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions? This is such a beautiful poster. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, this is Sharon, and I don't have a question. I have a kudo uh, because uh, we. This is uh, one of the kind of classic ways we're engaging these days. Is a pharma company came to us with several ideas about different conditions they wanted to study, and we, uh, Luna, and we uh, chose KCNT one derived epilepsy. Didn't know much about it, but were able to connect with two parents who then uh, with Sarah's help have grown an organization from zero to a hundred miles per hour in two years or so. Um, kind of, you know, many of you know that I founded PXE International in 1994 and it took me about 20 years to get as far as um, Sarah has gotten in two years. And so really impressive, impressive, both use of what's available to them as well as beating the bushes to find industry partners and so on. So kudos, Sarah, for all the work that you've done and done it so quickly. Thank you, Sharon. It, it hadn't been, wouldn't been possible without all these awesome people that I have met, that we have met in the rare disease world. It, it's amazing, the generosity and the sharing and, and the knowledge and, and the materials that people put out like Genetic Alliance and all the other rare disease groups. So, and Deb and Ian and Matthew and everybody. So thank you all. I'm sorry, Sarah, really quickly. It looked like you had a pretty good um, follow-up for that second round of surveys. Did you do anything in particular to like increase the engagement and keep them interested in being a part of this or um, what was that? <laughs> well, we use social media and post insights and like that's mostly what we did and then in, we have private facebook groups where we remind people it's out there we're actually going to be launching a really big um campaign to we're going to be uh, we're bringing on a new survey um that's going to be have a lot more information to help us with a cohort selection for studies so um our main goal for our registry is really to support an IND application and to augment existing natural history studies that are being done by pharma. But increasingly we see our role as being able to carefully select participants for studies and trials because we have different phenotypes. Some of the kids cannot walk or talk, some of them can. So a parent whose kid cannot walk does not want to get a survey about somebody that, you know, how that's running their bike or whatever. It's just, we need to be able to separate um, the invitations and the recruitment, I think, by segment. So anyways, we are going to be updating our surveys and starting a big campaign to recruit new patients, international patients. We've got surveys in different languages. I'm so happy that Luna now has different um, languages in there. And so 
anybody, if anybody has any suggestions or ideas for recruiting, I'm just going to be just putting together a whole campaign and um, trying to convince people that this is what they can do. And a lot of international patients, this is all they can do. They can't participate in our trials in the U.S., so this is really all they can do. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, we can move on to Andy. And I believe Matthew will bring up his slides. Great. Um, I wanted to thank Genetic Alliance for um, inviting me to share um, some of the lessons that we've learned from our natural history study. Um, I'm part of the Timothy Syndrome Foundation that was founded in, in um, collaboration with Catherine Timothy, for which this disease is named. Next slide, please. Timothy Syndrome is a really complex disease. It was first identified in the early 90s as a disease that had long QT arrhythmias associated with syndactyly, and that became known as type 1. And a year or two later, they noticed that it was a, a second type in which instead of syndactyly, these kids um, had hip dysplasia. And then over the years, we've noticed that there's all these other complex systems that are affected because this gene is ubiquitously expressed throughout the body, and we wanted to bring attention to all these other symptoms that are way underreported and way understudied. And so that's why we wanted to do a natural history study and try to learn more about these other symptoms. Next slide, please. So Timothy syndrome is caused by a very specific variant in the CACNA1C gene. It's a calcium channel that's expressed very highly in the heart and the brain. Other variants of this gene can also cause a subset of Timothy syndrome symptoms. And right now we're referring to them as Timothy syndrome-like because they don't have all the same symptoms. And yet other variants in the CACNA1C gene can cause just the arrhythmia. And we're now calling this non-syndromic long QT8. And then the majority, I believe, of CACNA1C variants are likely to cause just neurological problems without any cardiac defects. And we're referring to these as CACNA1C related disorders or CRDs. Turns out that this is one of the major markers of autism. Next slide, please. So we wanted to focus on, on those that we believe really had a true case of Timothy syndrome. So we unfortunately, before we discovered Luna, did a Google form questionnaire to all the people that we've been following since that, since that Catherine's been following since the 1990s. So we sent out a 150 question, question questionnaire to learn more about the non-cardiac symptoms since these are so understudied. We email invited everyone we knew that has this variant. And we were fortunate enough that 93 of 109 um, participants responded to the survey and so that was a, a great success rate of over 90%. About only 10 of these were CACNA-related disorders, which we didn't pursue in our natural history study. And we're only considering Timothy syndrome or long QT8. We're, um, we are boosting our numbers with cases that were written up in the literature. We did ask in our survey if um, the parent's child had been previously written up so that we weren't duplicating our numbers. And though this is really U US and European heavy, we believe our total community right now is less than 100 worldwide. Next slide, please. Potential problems, what we've now learned from going back and writing this, trying to write this natural history is that any open-ended ended question that could not be answered by yes, no, or a pull-down menu became a problem. Skipping questions really became a problem because we didn't know if we should assume the answer was no or not applicable. Um, and then of course, I think one of the caveats of any parental based survey is just the ability to recall dates and events. Um, and so 
we, there's nothing we can really do about that. Um, and I think it's worth noting that most individuals do not have their whole exome sequenced. So you always have to be worried that some of these symptoms, especially with Timothy syndrome-like, are actually related to other variants in their genome, since we don't really know what those other variants might be. And then another potential problem was not asking for confirmation of the diagnosis, such as a genetic test or an ECG to see that they had long QT syndrome. Next slide, please. So the lessons I believe that we've learned as we're writing this natural history study up is that we should really stick to yes, no questions and actually have a uh, pull down menu that says not applicable for questions where we might be asking about something that a toddler does, but the, the actual child is only a newborn or, or six months old. We also should use pull down menus when asking about age, variants, symptoms, and try to avoid having the respondents have to fill in a, a blank question, just a blank question. And the other thing we've learned is we really shouldn't allow skipping of questions because we didn't know how to interpret them as whether they meant no, or they meant not applicable, or they meant don't recall. So in all future surveys, I think a more acceptable answer would be not applicable or don't recall. Luna does suggest to us now that in the future, we should keep all our questionnaires to 10 or 20 questions so that these families can quickly handle them and not be overwhelmed. And then just send out different surveys every few weeks as we wanna probe deeper. And the other thing that we um, learned in our lesson is that included in our IRB, which we got through Genetic Alliance, should be the option to ask for medical records, genetic tests, or any confirmation of a real diagnosis, and maybe even potentially tissue and blood samples. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and also, um, if we need, we should have an open-ended question, like are there other symptoms that we didn't cover in this survey? And we did find that in our survey, we did this, and now we have to, do future surveys to figure out if some of these questions, some of the answers are just anecdotal and it applies to one child, or if it's actually more common. And for example, we did find out that um, our kids have stomach issues a lot worse than we ever had uh, noticed before. And that's, I think, because these kids have so many different serious life-threatening issues that you know constipation doesn't surface to the top until we do a survey. So I think that was another lesson we learned. And then I think in the last slide is just my, my uh, can, um, contact if you'd like to um, contact me. And I would like to really stress that this was all possible because Catherine Timothy has been following these kids since 19, the early 1990s and has been following them since then. And so we were able to contact just about every family that we know that has Timothy syndrome. And, um, and the gene wasn't actually cloned until 2004. So we're following families that have since been confirmed to have mutations in CACNA1C. So I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a question in the chat from Caitlin. Um, she said, have you ever tried implementing logic or branching rather than not applicable? Um, yeah, we're going we, we have considered that and we will do that as well. Yeah, that makes sense. It would be nice to know why it wasn't, why it is not applicable. I also had a question. Um, I noticed in your first, I think second slide, first or second slide, you mentioned that you had over 90% success in respondents. Um, I guess if you could elaborate on what contributed to that, because that's like unbelievably high response rate. Well, I really attribute all this to Catherine Timothy because she's she's been retired for 15 or 20 years and still continues to communicate with each and every family by social media, email, telephone. And I think when she asks you to fill out a survey, our families felt very obliged and they're very appreciative that she has followed these children 
because none of the doctors that originally diagnosed them, or very few of them, still follow these children. And so Catherine has become the authority on Timothy syndrome, even though she's retired. And that's why I thought it very important that we write a natural history, because we some of the ch children are now in their early 30s. And so we can really write a complete natural history of these kids. And it's not just a small time frame; it's, it's their entire lives. So it's really attributed to Catherine Timothy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for, thanks for that great presentation. Um, we now have Maria. Yeah, I'll go ahead and great. share my screen. Just one second. There, can everyone see? Yes, okay. So hi everyone, I'm Maria. I'm Senior Program Manager at Colorectal Cancer Canada. Um, Canada is the can is uh, Colorectal Cancer Canada is Canada's nonprofit colorectal cancer patient organization. We're dedicated to colorectal cancer awareness and education, um, supporting patients and caregivers, and advocating on their behalf. So the research project I'll be presenting today is actually under the umbrella of the Get Personal program. Um, this is a program we launched in uh, 2019. And basically the program aims to empower cancer patients to obtain personalized cancer care by having unfettered access to their genomic profile so that this can improve their quality of life, but also increase their overall survival. So just for the introduction, uh, here in Canada, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar, uh, cancer care is administered and delivered by, the, by provinces and territories. So it's provincial rather than federal. And so this is actually a model that can impede harmonization of healthcare and equity of access across the country. In addition, um, personalized medicines in particular here depend on access to both the drug that's targeted to the specific biomarker and testing for the appropriate biomarker. So unlike the US, um, this is something you do, you may know, but the use of national guidelines for oncology clinical practice actually encourages standardization of biomarker testing in the US. But here in Canada, we, have, uh, we don't have national guidelines. And so healthcare professionals instead rely on periodic publication of recommended testing standards by oncologists in their area of specialty. And most importantly, the process of reimbursement of biomarker testing is a patchwork in Canada with limited data on current practices, um, rates of reimbursement, equity of access, and patient outcomes. So under the Get Personal program, CCC uh, developed a pan-tumor, pan-Canadian survey that was sent to multidisciplinary healthcare professionals. And this aimed to conduct a high-level environmental scan of current biomarker testing practices at cancer care institutions across Canada. So just to mention, due to this survey-based data collection and relatively the small sample size that we had, this project isn't intended to be a systematic analysis of any sort of cancer administration. It's rather a high-level environmental scan of biomarker testing practices that was conducted by us uh, as a patient organization. So the survey was disseminated two years ago in August 2020 using Google Forms. We had invited around 150 healthcare professionals. The questions that we developed were um, created and developed by us at CCC, but we also received feedback from healthcare professionals who are part of our scientific advisory committee. So they medically reviewed all our questions and gave us any feedback before we disseminated it. The questions were written to include all cancer types. So as I mentioned, although we are a colorectal cancer patient organization, we really wanted our results and the data to come out of this to be a pan tumor because this is important across all tumor sites. Um, the questions were optional to answer and the data was collected in Excel format and analyzed using descriptive statistics in November, 2020. The data, as you will see in the, in the poster is reported in aggregate only and is pooled by province and not by institution or by respondent. So I'll just zoom in here so you can like see my figures a bit more. Um, so for our demographics, the survey sample consisted of 42 healthcare professionals. This came from 26 different institutions and we had at least one representative from each province. 
Um, so the fraction of our respondents from each, the fraction of respondents from each pro province actually reflects the percent distribution of the Canadian population by province. Um, so this means that we do have some sort of high level environmental scan of how biomarker testing practices are performed in Canada. So to just go in through some of our survey results, most of our results showed that biomarker testing practices really differs across provinces, but also across institutions within the same provinces. So for example, when we asked about the earliest stage at which cancer patients are offered biomarker testing to explore their therapeutic op options, we had approximately 30% who said that they offer it at stage one, but also 30% said that they offer it at stage three. But actually most of our respondents mentioned that this is that order testing really varies by cancer type. Um, so for example, we did get to see that panel tests, including MSI, RAS, and RAF biomarkers aren't ordered reflexively for colorectal cancer patients, but it is ordered reflexively for lung and breast cancer patients. So these uh, survey results really helped us see how um, biomarker testing is unfortunately varies a lot across provinces, across institutions, and across tumor sites. So patients here, depending on their disease sites, really have different access uh, to biomarker testing depending on where they are and what type of disease site, they, uh, uh, cancer type they have. There is also variation in access to testing for different biomarkers. So Colorectal cancer patients have access to most of the predictive colorectal cancer biomarkers. By predictive, I mean those that have a matched targeted therapy. But what we got to see from the survey results is that the turnaround times, which is basically the time at which the biomarker test was ordered to the, time, to the, to the point at which the patient has uh, the results available, is really different for predictive biomarkers and varies depending on the type of biomarker, the testing modality that's available in this institution and whether the institution has this test in-house or off-site. We also uh, wanted to see what the, tur the turnaround time is for molecular results. And what we got to see is that some institutions have a turnaround time of around three to four days, while others have an extreme, um, like on the extreme side of the, of the spectrum, they have like eight weeks of a turnaround time. So you can really see that the turnaround time differs. And what my two examples that I just gave now, right now are in the same province. So you can really see that in the same province, institutions have very different ways of ordering biomarker tests for their patients. So we got to see that for our 42 respondents, the average turnaround time using NGS, which is next generation sequencing, is actually 3.26 weeks. Uh, knowing how cancer patients on, go through their journey, three, waiting three weeks is a very, very long time in order to receive um, your results. And then basically also just knowing which um, target therapy you should be on. So unfortunately, not, not all patients would wait that long to get their um, results back. And so most usually end up going on chemotherapy, although they, may could have, they could have been matched to a more targeted therapy, for example, immunotherapy, if they were um, MSI DMMR positive. What we also got to see is that biomarker testing is used to make patient care decisions in different settings. And what I mean by that is that, for example, 70% of our respondents reported that biomarker testing is used to make patient care decisions for patients with metastatic disease only, so only if they're at stage four. But we still had 60% of our respondents also say that biomarker testing is done only if there's a Health Canada approved therapy associated with that biomarker. Other results showed that there is a low percentage of patients who received their testing results in time to decide first line therapy. So less than one third of our respondents reported that around 50 to 75% of their patients will have their results in time to decide first line therapy. This is very in line with the turnaround time that I mentioned. Um, so if they don't receive their molecular results in time, they just immediately go on any available therapy uh, that's accessible to them, and they don't really wait uh, for them to get their results back to see if they could be matched to a more targeted therapy for them. 
86% of our respondents also reported that med medical oncologists are the ones who are ordering biomarker tests for their patients. But we also made sure to ask them who they think should be ordering um, the biomarker test for patients. And actually most of them, 80% said that they think pathologists should have the ability to order biomarker testing for patients as well. We asked our respond, our, the survey respondents, what were the common challenges and barriers faced with biomarker testing? And most of them, 78% said that the most common challenge is the inadequacy and insufficiency of samples. More than half also said it's because of the inadequate reimbursement for the test. So if a test isn't reimbursed for, they wouldn't really offer it to the patient. Uh, half, approximately half also said that it's because of the unavailability of a certain test at their institution. And again, approximately half said that a common challenge is the long turnaround times. So because a, a particular med medical oncologist knows that the, the patient is at stage four, they don't have enough time to get the results back, they'll just immediately not order the test for them, which is quite unfortunate. Maria, you got about like 30 seconds. Okay, Thank so you. almost done. Um, barriers were also very similar to the common challenges, lack of funding to labs, lack of reflex testing, and lack of testing available at their institution. So just for, our for the conclusions of this uh, project, biomarker testing, as you can see, isn't currently uniformly a standard of care in Canada. And so the lack of standardized guidelines and coordination between the centers may prevent the administration of precision oncology care in Canada. So we hope that this research uh, can generate knowledge of current biomarker testing practices, but also most importantly, inform decision making and provide opportunities for the standardization of care and access to biomarker testing here in Canada. Um, hope, I hope I'm done right in time. <laughs> great, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, and we actually have one more presentation. Uh, George Gondo, if you would like to share your screen or you want Matthew to share his screen. Oh, okay, great. We can see it. Looks good. All right, yep, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, all right, uh, thanks, uh, Georgia and everyone for, for inviting me to present. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit, very high level about some of the patient-centered research that's ongoing at the National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, so psoriasis is a um, chronic immune-mediated um, systemic inflammatory disease that's uh, most commonly characterized by um, inflammation on the skin. Um, and um, at, the, at the NPF, we have worked with uh, the Genetic Alliance on a number of our different research endeavors. We have a biobank in addition to some of the patient-centered activities that we have listed here. Um, so what I want to talk about today is our citizen scientist patient powered research platform with over 6000 participants, um, our annual survey, which we've been conducting for over 20 years to understand the actual health outcomes of, of patients uh, and individuals with psoriasis. Um, our advocacy survey, which looks at barriers to care experienced by individuals with psoriasis and then talk about some of our ad hoc surveys and ad hoc uh, patient engagement um, activities, in particular. Um, a two-wave survey we did during the COVID pandemic. And particularly what I want to highlight with this is just some of the outcomes of these uh, research activities, not necessarily in terms of uh, granular outcomes of the studies themselves, but um, the impact in the larger field of psoriasis, which is, which is something that um, we've been very successful um, in translating our research activities into actual um, impact um, in the knowledge base for psoriasis and about patients with psoriasis. So uh, Citizen Scientist is a very unique platform um, in that it is powered by patients. So patients contribute their data to it. Um, and it also empowers patients to be researchers themselves, right? So they can both, they can pose research questions to, to the foundation and they can also analyze the data using a couple of tools that we've developed to allow them to create their own discoveries and, and, and data visualizations. So they can explore things like uh, family history, uh, disease triggers treatments to compare themselves with others um, who may be like themselves with, with psoriasis or just have a better understanding of, of what to expect um, as someone living with, with this chronic disease. We've been pretty successful with, with the data that has been collected within citizen scientists in terms of publications and presentations. There have been numerous posters at some of the leading 
uh, Dermatological uh, Association conferences. In particular, I want to highlight these two publications, uh, one looking at uh, sleep disturbance in patients with psoriasis, um, which is one of the, one of the first uh, studies that we published using these data. And one thing that's interesting here, I, I don't think you can really see my cursor, but in that uh, author field, um, at least half of the, those individuals that are on that author line are patients themselves. So we published this in conjunction with patients. These are individuals who are on our citizen scientists uh, governance committee and help oversee, um, oversee the platform. So we were really, really um, happy with, with that. And then we're also very pleased to have uh, published um, a study validating the self-report diagnosis of psoriasis, um, which um, was something that uh, really lends a lot of weight, further weight to this data um, and helps build its uh, legitimacy in the eyes of a lot of uh, academic uh, researchers. Um, our annual survey, so this is something we, we work with a lot of our key opinion leaders and subject matter experts to assemble, um, and it's a cross-sectional study. We pull patients, uh, individuals with psoriasis from our database, we stratify them, we randomize them, uh, engage them with an online survey with some validated patient-reported outcome measures and a lot of other uh, questions. That's pretty long, but they still take it, and that, that's really good. It really shows how engaged they are with, with the foundation. And I'm really thankful that they do because we've been very successful in leveraging those data into actual uh, impacting the evidence base for psoriasis. So we've had over 10 uh, conference presentations at the leading um, conferences and meetings of uh, you know, dermatologists and rheumatologists, both um, in the United States and internationally. And we've had over seven peer reviewed publications with many of the leading uh, key opinion leaders um, in the field. And that's one thing that's been that's hugely important for the success of, of our survey is engaging those key opinion leaders very early on in the formation of the survey, asking them if there are particular types of uh, outcomes that they would like us to ask if they're interested in, and then also helping them to develop some new outcome measures, which is something that we're working on publishing now. Um, so one, one particular um, a uh, study that I would like to highlight is just understanding how patients view remission in psoriasis. So um, the treatments that are available for patients with psoriasis have been, uh, over the last 10 years, becoming increasingly more effective. Uh, so it's really important to understand what patients view as um, when their disease is remission. It, does it conform with how a provider might view it? Um, and what, what might impact it? And it's really interesting to see that um, uh, in particular, that female sex and having a um, uh, psoriatic arthritis in addition to psoriasis were associated with increased likelihood of feeling that their psoriasis was in remission, which um, at least for the female perspective, I think was, was kind of shocking. Uh, we might have thought that, that might be a little the other way. Males might feel that their psoriasis is in remission um, or more likely to feel that their psoriasis is in remission compared to females. But we also noted a very um, significant relationship between a quality of life impact um, and uh, remission. So it's not just skin clearance, but it's also just overall quality of life um, and mental health that, that are important when thinking about uh, remission. Another very important finding of this that runs counter to a lot of our key opinion leader um, perspective is that um, over 75% of the individuals that uh, responded to, to our survey and said that their psoriasis was, they feel that their psoriasis is in remission um, had some active lesions on their body. And this has been an ongoing debate within the, cl the clinician and researcher field as to what constitutes remission. And a lot of them would argue that 0% is what, what should, should be remission, but clearly here patients feel they're even happy with even just, just 1%. So um, our advocacy survey, again, very similar methodology as to our annual survey. This has a lot of really um, concrete impacts and benefits for, for our patients because they are informing our advocacy initiatives. So we take this data, we use it to create fact sheets, we use it to create one pagers that we engage um, our, um, uh, Congress, our members of Congress with on our uh, various advocacy initiatives, we both on the state and federal level. Um, and then we've also created some, uh, developed a peer reviewed publication on this. And you can see um, this is one of the first uh, papers, one of the first studies to, to look at um, the prevalence of utilization management policies 
um, not that did not rely on insurance claims data, which is really important. Um, there's some limitations to that, obviously, in terms of recall bias and things like that. But um, insurance policies um, sometimes that may not be captured adequately in those in those types of claims um, databases for for various reasons. And then um, our COVID survey. So because we've had we've built this really robust um, uh, survey uh, methods within our organization, we can rapidly produce surveys and rapidly field surveys and get data back and analyze it. This was extremely important during the beginning part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in 2020. And we really wanted to understand what patients with psoriasis, what individuals with psoriasis were feeling, um, what were their concerns. And um, this is really, really important in understanding that, that healthcare providers needed tools to engage their patients with psoriasis on, on what their risks of uh, COVID-19 were, um, and what, whether their particular treatments might elevate their risk. Um, so we were able to, to put, this, put this data out there and then use it to emphasize the need for healthcare providers to reference the uh, COVID-19 um, COVID guidance statements that the, ta that the uh, National Psoriasis Foundation had developed um, so they can educate their patients um, based, on, uh, based on the evidence. So um, that's really it. Just want to keep it short and sweet. Um, a lot of great presentations. You guys are doing a lot of really phenomenal work out there. And uh, again, really happy to be a part of it. Uh, so thank you, Georgia. Thank you. Appreciate it. What a great presentation. It's like exciting to see how many, you know, organizations you are involved with. And, you know, policy is such an important part of what we do. Um, so it's really cool to be able to see that. Um, does anyone have any questions for George? Hey, George, how long have you been doing this? Uh, how long have I been doing this type of research? Um, so I have been engaged in, in sort of patient research for 13, 14-ish years. Uh, I've been at the, the National Psoriasis Foundation for uh, three years, but my, my background's in social sciences, so doing this type of survey work. And I was also fortunate that my, my graduate program emphasized um, participatory action research methods, um, which really translates very well into this type of patient-centered um, type of research and patient engagement. Well, it shows your, all of your experience. Have you ever seen the psoriatic arthritis commercial with Phil Mickelson? Um, I don't watch a lot of broadcast television. I'm probably sure I've seen it just because they're uh, those types of commercials are ubiquitous. Well, it's um, just a fun fact. He, he's throwing oranges and using his hands a lot. And mm -hmm. my daughter was his daughter in the commercial. Oh, that really? Was, oh, my fun fact. Yeah. My, my fun good. fact is we had, we had, uh, I was at a, uh, uh, my, one of my son's um, baseball games, my son's uh, seven. And um, one of my teammates messaged me on teams that there was a article talking about Kim Kardashian and her skin product line, which mentioned that she has psoriasis that cited one of our publications that I was a co-author on. So I, I was like, well, that's, that's cool that I'm now associated with a Kardashian yeah. and now that's going to amplify our research to like audiences we never even dreamed about. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Your 15 minutes of fame. Exactly. <laughs> All right, if there's not any more questions, um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope you learned as much as I did. Um, again, I wanna thank Deb, um, our wonderful speaker and all of our wonderful presenters um, for getting those you know, presentations to me. I really appreciate it. And um, we hope to do more events like this in the future just to get really everyone together. Um, and I wish everyone a great rest of their week. And I will just jump in last minute here and thank you, Georgia, for having this idea and for executing on it so beautifully. It was really well organized. I echo all of uh, Georgia's kudos on what you all are accomplishing. And I think it's really helpful for all of us to be buoyed up by each other, particularly if this is always extremely challenging work. So we're really, really happy to be here with you and to support you in the ways that we can. Uh, Georgia will follow up with some resources and services that Genetic Alliance offers, and uh, we can share anything you send our way with everybody else. So thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, good to be with you. 
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.